Professor Muhammad for inviting me and uh, thanks for uh, Dr. Ahmed and uh, Basim for a great talk. It's, uh, I think we all learned something uh, new today about to look at the scapula, the uh, scapular motion abnormalities. So it's quite interesting. Um, so I was asked to um, talk about scapular fractures. So I just wanted to give you uh, sort of a, uh, a slight uh, perspective on scapula because uh, until a few years ago, I don't think most of us were operating on scapula. And as we learned from our professors that most of the time scapular fractures are treated conservatively. But actually uh, in the last few years, we started to learn how to approach these fractures how to operate in them and how to get a good outcome from operating in them. And now also the literature is proving the same uh, all over the world. So the main question is when should we operate? Because as I said, most of us were taught in a way that you shouldn't operate on the scapula. They do well with conservative measurement, but the literature is telling us otherwise at the moment. So we're going to talk about the classification, the, the treatment indication approaches, outcomes, but also talk about combined injuries of the scapula. So when we talked about the classification, the older classifications were for extra, um, divided them into extra articular uh, scapular body and then process fractures. Then uh, Goss also described the neck fractures, whether displaced, undisplaced or angulated. But then Eidelberg uh, came and started to classify the actual glenoid fractures. So the type one uh, uh, fracture is sort of like a bony banquet, whether it's an anterior or posterior. The type two, uh, three, and four are single line fractures. And uh, type three, so I've sort of put a circle on it because it is the most tricky one. I mean, it's not necessarily the commonest, but the most tricky one to approach and work. Type two is, is uh, common and it's easy to operate. Similar to type four, easier to fix. And as you see with the approach, it will be easier to get through the standard approach. The type five is when you have two line fractures going into the glenoid. And the type six is the last one, is the comminuted one. So the incidence, the body is the commonest. That's prob why probably a lot of us were treating that conservative. Coracoid about 15%, neck 25%. But the glenoid, the intraarticular one, how we've been taught that intraarticular fractures are an indication for surgery are only 10%. And this is probably one of the reasons that most of the scapulas were not being treated and only the markedly displaced intraarticular ones that were being uh, treated operatively. But now we know that we should be treating more from the evidence and from the literature. So when we have a fractured scapula, we, I don't want you to think as just a bony skeleton. Actually, it's quite a serious injury. And we've, um, they found that in a lot of the cases, up to 90%, there's an associated injury. So don't forget the ribs, the lungs, um, and the shoulder, cervical spine, and, uh, and all the other areas around the scapula that might be injured. So it's quite a serious injury when you see a scapula. Please look outside the scapula before we focus on the bone. Treat those before we go on to the scapula. It's rarely uh, anything urgent about fixing the scapula, but it's actually the other ones are the most serious that need to be handled. So when we think of management, we obviously, because of these associated injuries, you're thinking about the ATLS, consider the associated injuries, cervical is more important, of course, breathing, the lungs, the uh, tube intubation might be more serious. There are surgical indications, which we will mention, but if we go for conservative, it's simple, like we've, most of us have done, sling, cold, uh, and a passive range of motion early, and then maybe in three to four weeks, start active assisted, followed by active by six weeks when the fracture heals. Now, what's most important is that we learn the indications of surgery for scapular fractures and what gives the uh, better outcome. So for intraarticular fractures, uh, we know that if we see a subluxation of the humeral head, then, then that's an indication of surgery. Anteroinferior, posterior inferior fractures, whether it's one third, one fourth of the articular surface, that will cause instability. The head will be too much uh, unstable and that needs to be fixed. And of course, any intraarticular step. Now that used to be a four millimeter or a five millimeter indication. But as with most joints, we do not accept more than two millimeter uh, displacement. So I would propose that we continue the two millimeter mark as we do with most joints. If you see a step, we know that that will cause friction and that will cause osteoarthritis later on. Now, 
since the extra articular are much more common, these are the ones that we were not treating. And now new indications have come up to tell us that we should be fixing those because we have a lot of muscles besides the outside ones that Basim has just spoken about. We have the inside, the anterior subscap, the infraspinatus, teres minor, the supraspinatus, all these are working on the shoulder. And if they don't have the proper way to work, if they have a displaced bone on the way, that will affect their function and their activity. So the indications, two centimeters of medial border, and this is the medial border. And if it's displaced two centimeters, now some of the more literature are becoming more, uh, uh, more picky than we're going for a one centimeter displacement. But at the moment, the two centimeter stands if it's just that. The glenopolar angle is very important, which is the angle between the glenoid and a line from the apex of the, you know, uh, of the uh, acromion to the inferior angle of the scapula. Normally it's 30 to 45 degrees. So if this is reduced and more than one factor will reduce that, not only a neck fracture, but the displacement that will reduce the glenopolar angle, they found that if it's less than 25, that would lead to disadvantage of the working muscles and thus poorer function of the shoulder. If you have an angulation in the axial view, more than 40 degrees, or if you have an angulation 30 degrees plus a displacement of about one and a half centimeters, as stated by Peter Cole and, uh, and uh, co-authors, then that's an indication of surgery. And lastly, if you have a displaced floating shoulder, we've always known floating shoulders to be fracture of the scapula plus the clavicle. But if we have a displacement of more than a centimeter, that's also an indication of operative treatment. So these are the very important ones that you keep in mind because we know the intraarticular ones, they're sort of common sense with our experience of articular fracture fixation, but the extra articular ones that we should focus, we should start looking for them and they are the indication of surgery. Now the approaches, many approaches have been described from the classic Jude to the modified anterior approach, superior, posterior, and the lateral approaches, but the most common and most of the scapular fractures, you will be able to operate through the Jude approach, the, either the classic or the modified. Now, the difference between the classic and the modified, the classic used to describe a very long incision along the medial border of the scapula going on the superior border, and then lift all the skin flap to reach the lower part. The modified Jude is just a straight incision from the posterior acromion edge to the inferior border of the scapula. Personally, I've only rarely used the classic. I've always used the modified Jude, which actually gives you a very good, uh, very good exposure. You can reach both borders of the scapula easily. And if you want to do even a smaller one of the modified Jude, just more on the medial border for uh, smaller fractures, that can also be done. Now, this is just to go through the anatomy. Uh, you know that this is the scapula right shoulder. This is the inferior angle of the scapula. We have the teres major, and we have the deltoid covering the area where we want to work. We have the infraspinatus, the teres minor, and the triceps coming to hold in the infraglenoid tubercle. So we want to work in this region beneath the deltoid between the teres minor and the infraspinatus. So if we actually take off the deltoid, if we take it, uh, detach this uh, part from the scapular spine, then we can easily find the infraspinatus teres minor. We split them, and then we find the posterior scapula where most of the fractures will be, and also we can open up the joint to reach the intraarticular fragment. Now, do we have to take down the deltoid every time? This paper found that you can do 90% of the surgeries, we can reach 90% of the uh, desired uh, part that you want to reach without deltoid takedown. So only if you have an upper glenoid or neck fracture that you need to take down the deltoid. Otherwise, just abduction and dissection beneath the deltoid will be enough. Anything on the lower part of the glenoid, on the lateral border of the scapula, we do not need to take down the deltoid. So we also have the anterior approaches. Now for type one uh, that I was described, which is the anterior bony bankard, but now we can think of doing that arthroscopic. You can also use it for a type three, which is the superior glenoid fracture, the Eidelberg type three, with or without coracoid osteotomy. Now this is an example of an arthroscopic one. Preoperative, you can see a large bony avulsion 
of the uh, glenoid with the labrum. So it's not a labrum and a classic bank cut. It's not the classic bony bank cut, but rather a large bony piece. And this would be the type one uh, from the uh, scapular uh, glenoid fracture. And uh, to do that, you can do that by arthroscopic. Peter Millet describes something called the uh, bony bridge technique. You use four anchors, one beneath, and then it goes around and you fix it above to sort of sandwich that bony fragment with two anchors above and below on the labrum. And you may need to do another anchor on the superior labrum. And this is sort of the post-op CT uh, where you can see that it's nicely, nicely, uh, nicely reduced in place and actually uh, starting healing about six weeks. These guys uh, describe the superior approach for the IDB3. So you go in from superior, uh, they go in, this is the scapula, clavicle, AC joint. They go on the supraspinatus and then they mobilize the supraspinatus either anterior or posterior, taking care of the suprascapular nerve and artery and fix the, uh, uh, fix the scapular fracture from superior with internal fixation screws and knee plates. Now, this is a case and the indication of surgery, this is uh, as I showed you. So I think one good example of obviously you need good quality x-ray, but even with a good quality x-ray, it's not enough. You need 3D CT in most of these fractures to be able to really assess the fracture and uh, think about your plan. So here, the indication of surgery, obviously the angulation is more than 40 degrees. We have an intra-articular displaced fracture, the whole glenoid itself is displaced. So this is our indication of surgery. So we do the modified Jude. This is the right shoulder, posterior acromion to the inferior angle. This is the deltoid. We flip the deltoid. You find the interval between the teres minor and infraspinatus. You open that up and then you can do all your fixation. Just uh, bring the glenoid back into place. You depend here a little bit on indirect reduction that if you uh, reduce the lower part of the glenoid in place, the superior part is falling into uh, the proper position and you do your internal fixation. And these, this is the Y view and the uh, AP view of the scapula. Another case uh, with a male uh, patient with an upper trunk brachial plexus. And this brings me to the attention that because these injuries are quite severe, it's not uncommon that we found that they have some sort of brachial plexus palsy. This is something you should consider and you should investigate pre-op so it's documented. You know, it's not gonna affect your decision to operate, but rather that you should have it documented. So post-op, if his uh, uh, recovery is delayed, his active muscle function is delayed, you know that this was present pre-operative. Again, the CT is very descriptive. So the indication here is obviously the displacement uh, of the two centimeters of the body. And that, as you can see, will reduce the glenopolar angle uh, considerably and lead to a poorer function. So uh, through a classic, again, modified Jude, we just fixed the simple plating, you get back the border in place. And then he had also magnetic stimulation to stimulate the muscles. And you can see the video at six weeks, he's already have, uh, has a good elevation of the muscles. He continues magnetic stimulation for usually 15 to 30 days. And that leads to a much quicker recovery of the, uh, of the palsy. Another case which you can see is a bit more severe. Our indication here, the glenoid is completely floating. The, you can imagine that the uh, long head of triceps has a valve that it's completely separated from the body and from the upper part of the scapula. So this is our indication of surgery. Again, posterior approach, you can, you can do all that. And we repair the uh, lateral border and we use a 3.5 millimeter uh, locking plate. So most of these I use locking plates because the scapula is quite thin and sometimes you only have a 40 millimeter screw to hold. Therefore, locking screws uh, are my preferred choice for these fractures. And uh, actually right away you start um, passive range of motion immediately after the operation and maybe active assisted at three to four weeks. Now we also described uh, this, uh, what's known as the coracoid screw because a lot of the time, sometimes when you do a posterior Jude approach, you have a base of coracoid fracture. So we did a cadaveric study and we described the AP view of the coracoid, which is a new view. Describe the angle so you know that your coracoid is reduced. So you have the lateral Y view, you have the AP view and the proper angle to get the coracoid fixation from the back. So you don't need to do a separate approach from anterior to fix the coracoid, but actually if you reduce it and get a screw directly uh, into it from the posterior approach, Jude. 
Now, the outcomes, uh, Cole has described now five to 10 years uh, follow up, and uh, they found that the DASH scores are very close to the normal. The strength of, fix of the, uh, of the uh, shoulder is almost similar to the normal side because you're not violating a lot of the muscles. And if you don't do a deltoid uh, takedown, actually you can do even active assisted very early post-operative. They found that the external rotation is slightly decreased compared to the normal shoulder. Um, now, this paper looked at the uh, scapular fractures going to the ER in 2015, and all of these patients did not have surgery, but when they looked at the CT and the x-rays and compared them with the current indication of surgery, they found that 19% of them should have had surgery. So we're probably missing a lot of surgeries of the scapula that can lead to a better outcome, as most of us have been used to treating them conservatively. Now, uh, to go beyond the scapula or slightly above the scapula, the rest of the shoulder complex, which is the superior shoulder suspensory complex of the shoulder. Uh, before it was described as the floating shoulder, and uh, but Goss described that early and it describes the whole chain that's holding the scapula and the shoulder connected together. And that's the glenoid, the coracoid, the uh, CC ligaments, the clavicle, the AC joint and the acromion. So if you break Two of those, that was the floating shoulder that we uh, knew about. And you can have a disruption either ligamentous or bony. And that's your disruption of the complex. And all these fractures or ligamentous injuries can, can be described as a uh, superior suspensory complex injury. The floating shoulder, we know that. We know it's a fracture of the clavicle and the neck of the scapula. So should we fix it or not? Now, the, I'll come to that. So this is an example of a triple superior shoulder suspensory complex injury. And if you can see that, we have the coracoid braces fractured. We have the distal lateral third clavicle fracture, but we also have an acromial fracture. So this is a triple fracture, not the ligaments. The ligaments here are intact. You can imagine that the CC ligaments are intact. That's why this evolves after the fracture of the scapula. So uh, this is a demonstration of the triple injury to the complex. And you cannot do a hook plate in this fracture because the hook plate depends on fixing on the acromion. Therefore, you also have to fix the acromion while doing the hook plate for the clavicle. And then you fix the coracoid also. And this is what they have done in this example. This is uh, another uh, injury. They describe sometimes triple, sometimes quadruple disruption for the superior suspensory complex. So you have the neck fracture, you have the base of coracoid fracture and an acromion fracture. Again, triple injury, therefore with displacement and the, uh, most of the authors now that if you have displacement more than a centimeter in a double or a triple injury, then that's an indication of surgery. And this is, uh, this is by Peter Cole. So he's fixed the acromion. He's fixed the coracoid with a screw, medial and lateral fixation of the scapula. Uh, this is one of actually the sort of cases I faced early on in my practice when I started doing scapular fractures about four to five years ago. And as usual, you, got, you get the most complex cases very early on uh, in your experience. This was a malnun union of a triple suspensory complex injury. He was delayed because he has the chest injury. He was in ICU for a while. So the scapula was ignored. And as you think the X-ray, the CT does look as horrible. And you can see that the glenoid is completely floating. Coracoid is fractured. You can imagine that the CC ligaments are intact. AC showing a little bit of subluxation, but the coracoid is completely off. So uh, this, as this was more than two months, uh, we went in from posterior. And as you can see in the video, after mobilizing the, some of the non-union, the malunions, everything is moving by itself completely separate. This is the glenoid with the humeral head, superior scapula. And in these cases where you have a very big deformity, we don't only do a deltoid takedown, but we did an infraspinatus flat flip. So we removed the infraspinatus completely on the other side. We left it attached. We left it attached to the, this is deltoid, this is infraspinatus. We leave it attached to the nerve, uh, the suprascapular nerve coming on the top and you just flip it completely, uh, detach it, and that gives you exposure of the whole body of the scapula. Surprisingly, this patient early on two months was able to do a quite reasonable elevation of his shoulder. 
Uh, this is the plate. Uh, I said this was early on. Uh, what I might have done differently is added also coracoid fixation, but to us it was quite uh, different. Uh, and even the CT post-operative still looks a bit scary. But we've able to manage, so you have the humeral head articulating with the glenoid that's fixed to the upper scapula, connected with the AC joint to the clavicle, and this is how he's functioning. I would have preferred that we fix the coracoid, but as you see, it's probably sticky from all these uh, comminution, and his function was quite reasonable, even with this fracture. So the outcomes of floating shoulder, uh, these papers looked at a systematic review of uh, 70 studies, 370 shoulder, and they found half of them, about 150, had a surgery for a floating shoulder. Most of them were getting clavicular fractures. Only 30% were getting fixation of the clavicle and the scapula. And they found that when you, when you have a non-displaced fracture and you do conservative management, these patients did very well. When you have a displaced fracture of the clavicle or the scapula, then that needs to be operated. These also do very well. They found, of course, that the surgery restore the glenopolar angle better than the not operative ones. Then this paper also, again, looking at the glenopolar angle and the outcomes of floating shoulder. And they found that the better you restore the glenopolar angle, the better the constant score that you have. Again, these ones would have non-displaced, non-operative, the displaced clavicle had fixation and a smaller percentage have a displaced clavicle and scapula. And that needs to be, then both of them need to be fixed. Both all these groups, according to this plan of work, led to good outcome. So in summary, uh, the indications is that you have an angulation of more than 40 degrees of the body of the scapula, glenopolar angle less than 25 or 20 degrees, this displacement of one to two centimeters of the body uh, by itself is an indication for surgery. If for the glenoid, any dis uh, incongruity about two millimeters or more, instability if it's a large piece, uh, then causing instability of the joint that you need to do intraarticular fixation. Don't forget that in the associated, the superior suspensory complex injuries, if we have a combined treat, everyone, every injury as if you're treating it separately. So if the scapula is displaced, there's an indication, fix it. If the clavicle is displaced with the classic indication of scapula, uh, clavicle fixation, then you need to fix it. Think about the glenopolar angle. And if you restore that, you will have a better function of the shoulder. Now, surprisingly, as we're seeing from the publication and the literature and from our experience, the complication rate for fixing these scapular fractures, even the bigger injuries is actually not that high. And even for mal unions you still get quite a good result, even if you do them delay. So we should be fixing more scapular fractures. And to me, the scapula is the new acetabulum. We should be focusing on that and giving the upper limb also in the shoulder, the very good function that it deserves. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Hatem Gerald Zaki, for this uh, very nice and very interesting talk about scapular fractures. Uh, now we come to the uh, questions, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Um, thanks, Prof. Hatem, uh, for this uh, wonderful talk. It's uh, scapula is the dark side of the shoulder. We we are we are most of the even the general orthopedic surgeons uh, can easily deal with the proximal humerus fractures or clavicle, but going back to the scapula is a bit uh, strange. So it's it's a good highlight about this. And uh, um, as you said, uh, I think we are uh, operating much less than should be. Um, one one question, it's it's more like a case scenario, glenoid uh, fracture, uh, articular fracture healed with a step of four millimeter um, in 30 years old. And he get, he has a painful click. Uh, this is about uh, six months after the injury. So what, how would you deal with such management? Is this click coming from the, the step that it's interarticular? So just overview on such scenario. I mean, I think we, if we go back to the basic principles that we use for any joint. So if we have a malunion of our articular surface, we, we know that that will lead to osteoarthritis. So for me, I would see, depending on the fracture pattern, where it is, then whether you need to approach it from uh, posterior or um, or elsewhere, if it's a superior malunion, then uh, I would uh, try to do an osteotomy and bring that back into place. Okay. Basim, do you have a, what do you think about that question? Um, that's, a, that's a tricky one, in fact, but I agree with you. The only problem with this is uh, 
uh, like, of course, if someone like you is going to do it, okay. The problem is sometimes you can go wrong with these. Whenever you go intra-articular on the glenoid and you want to break it and fix it. And uh, I think we have to be convinced that this is truly symptomatic. Click, it means like partly is symptomatic, causing pain. And I agree totally with you on the location of the fracture. Because let's say you have a little bit of anterior inferior or like maybe even especially the proximal one, like uh, two weeks ago, there's a proximal one that has no step off, but has a gap of four millimeter and has no suprascapular nerve side for her lower trapezius. And arthroscopically, I try to fix it, start to heal. I know if I want to break it just to approximate the surface, it may cause more, more grief. So I, I just uh, want to make sure for the uh, all the surgeons that they're hearing is to do an osteotomy, intra-articular osteotomy of the glenoid is other than technically challenging, it just want to make sure it's worth it to be done, depending on the location, everything else. So this is my, I agree with you. Uh, I did enjoy, I did enjoy your talk a lot and uh, uh, again, 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 I am a big fan of the scapula, as you know, and it is really fascinating for me because sometimes it's bag of bone, like even the case you showed, which was really horrible, the one that you showed from you early on in your practice, that was an awful fracture. And with that, you just, just did some stabilization, even though you still have a big gap between the coracoid and the glenoid, and still patient function very, very well. So it's amazing because so much muscle you have, like you have, it is, I don't know if there's any muscle, any bone in the body that's moving this way and it's wrapped completely entrapped with supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis, it's holding the whole bone like, like you know, and, uh, and I, I think this is why it, give it, it, it gives it this kind of like uh, uh, ability to, to still be forgiving because many times when you don't fix this fracture, they still do okay. And in fact, many times, if it's not fixed well, it's much worse, especially the scapular body. The scapular body, and in my opinion, they're over being over-treated. The angulation, I agree with you because they affect the scapular thoracic motion. They're not angulated, let it be. They're surrounded by a huge amount of bloody muscle there correctly. But the cases you showed, no, no question, when you have the glenoid like essentially sliding off the whole scapula construct, these are the one need to be fixed. But again, again, as you said, uh, mentioned, technically they are demanding. The only thing I would say only as, I don't know, uh, an extra opinion for the plating, the current plating, there's no true plate for the glenoid only. What I mean is you're using different, like I saw in your, some of the pictures that you show from articles and from yours, that you're using different kind of T-plate or using like, uh, locking is very important. So what I have done, believe it or not, I, I have used the, the medial malleolar plate. The medial malleolar locking plate or lateral, it is thin, it has a lot of locking screw and you can bend it because the posterior glenoid, when you put something and you just put one screw, sometimes you feel you're not as happy, you know, because you did not get it. So now we have some plates we can modify just to give you this more screws to be placed in the posterior glenoid and fixation. Just, uh, this is only as a comment. What do you think? No, no, definitely. I agree with it's always a, it's always a question what plate should we use and how to put it. And, and you have this very big angle on the, uh, from the glenoid to the body that's always causing, you know, you need to really contour it. And it would be nice to have uh, all these pre-contoured nice plates. But exactly. uh, yeah, I mean, I use a 2.5 or sometimes a 2.7 uh, millimeter plates and, uh, and we lock that's, the, that's, uh, but it works. I mean, if, if we get two locking screws, I yeah. find that that usually gives you stability, especially if you have two plates in two different planes that that usually is, uh, that does well. And Hatem, like uh, the article that you published about, uh, I liked it a lot about the base of the coracoid that you can go from posterior inferior. So you've done a number of these where you were able to get the screws from the posterior yeah. mid on the line of the glenoid went to the coracoid, you were able to grasp it nicely? Yes, we've done a few cases. I mean, uh, because we've always thought about the problem with the patient is in a semi-prone position, then you need to flip him all the way and then dress again, drape again or do the anterior approach for the coracoid. And that's why the, the idea came to us. And we did this the cadaveric study, and then we had a, a few clinical cases with that, and it works nicely. And, and the angles actually are quite well because they're almost like 45 and 90 degrees. So the angles are uh, actually sort of simple to, uh, to try to get into the coracoid. Yep, yep, nice. Okay, very nice. Um, uh, one question about the commonest post-operative complication that I 
should be aware or expecting after scabber fixation? Um, well, the most important thing I think to take care of is the suprascapular nerve. I mean, uh, two things. First of all, finding the plane. That's usually the tricky part in the beginning when you're doing the approach. And uh, a lot of people sort of are misguided and go inside the infraspinatus. So you need to really find the, uh, the, the, the actual split between the infraspinatus and the teres minor. And if you go through the infraspinatus, then you might injure the nerve because you think you're inside the muscle in between and you might injure the nerve itself. If you find the plane, the, then, then the important thing is to sort of, even if you don't flip, I rarely flip the infraspinatus now, but I do mobilize it well so that it's mobile and I do external rotation of the shoulder and that may give some uh, movement for the nerve because sometimes you really have to get into that area and the plate is quite close and it goes under the nerve. So external rotation, good mobilization of the nerve and the muscle that would relax the nerve so that you don't injure the nerve. I think this is to me the most important. I have, and um, that's, that's it. I mean, infection is very rare. The muscles do well. Uh, we haven't seen much teratopic ossification. So I don't know, Basim, your experience in complications. Well, uh, so very well said. I will just add, sometimes the nerve is injured. And you, if you're not paying attention to it, you do the fixation or the fixation is done and the patient comes back, there's no infraspinatus. And you don't know whether you injured it or it was injured in originally. Sometimes the area is exactly at this ba back of the glenoid. Sometimes it transects the nerve completely. And to be honest with you, it become more tricky because if you found it, it will be wise to repair it because you can give the patient better chance you can elevate the muscle the way uh, Professor Hatem showed. Infraspinatus, you have different way to elevate. I don't advise to elevate to detach the infraspinatus from the insertion side because it's not bad to repair it. There's no problem. The problem it doesn't give you much exposure because you get stuck when you go from lateral to medial. When you go from medial to lateral better, it's sometimes tricky, but just how you elevate because you want to make sure to attach it nicely to stick. Because many times as you're attaching it, you feel like the muscle, if you don't do that dissection well, the muscle is thin, it almost shorten and does not give you the excursion. And I think this is why some of these cases that have some increase in external rotation because they still have teres minor and the infraspinatus is not functioning as well. So I agree fully, it's not only infra, infra and supra if the suprascapular nerve is not paid attention to before or after surgery. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect, thanks so much. Um, another question about having um, multiple ribs fractures uh, at the same time with scabber fractures. So when would you operate? Does it uh, make any difference when you choose when to operate to fix the scabber in this situation? I'll, I'll let Basim start and then I'll answer. Well, I know I you're, you're, like you really did such nice work showing all of this. Uh, uh, in my opinion, this is something we have to agree on with the chest, with the thoracic, with the pulmonary. If you have no more thorax, you have hemothorax, you have stuff like this. What you need to understand is um, if you fix the scapula and the ribs are floating, you're not going to have the function that you want. There's something we have to agree on because you may stage it or not. If we feel the ribs need to be fixed, we may even do it at the same time or we can stage it. Uh, uh, scapula, if the glenoid, the way uh, that uh, Professor Hatem showed, it's the, the, the glenoid is out, out of, of proportion. You have to fix it. There's no point. However, when we talked about it again and again, the scapula is the boat sailing on the chest. If the chest is down, the scapula is going to sink down. So this is something we have to agree on how to want to approach it to us with the thoracic. I fix the ribs myself, and I think Hatem is comfortable fixing the ribs, but this is something I would definitely address because you don't want to go in and fix the scapula and then you go in with the x-ray and the scapula completely tilted inside the chest. I, I agree definitely with Basim that you have to deal with the chest first, uh, whether you fix the scapula, same sitting or delay it even for two to three weeks, it's, it's not a major problem. Uh, in Egypt, we, uh, orthopedics, we don't touch the ribs actually, so it's a cardiothoracic uh, cardiothoracic surgeon, but although I'm, I'm quite actually intrigued up with the rib fractures now, but we're not allowed to touch Well, I, 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 I was trained to be cardiothoracic surgeon early on. This is why I, I deal with them, but I talk Very to them because usually they have no more thorax, hemothorax, stuff like this. 
yeah. when, when you deal with the scapula all the time, like you with the fracture, you notice eventually you, you have to, to know. But you know, in, in Egypt, it's slightly different. But yeah, I deal with yeah. this area a lot, a lot, a lot of time. So, yeah. That's you know, what's interesting for me. What is interesting for me, I, I agree. Like sometimes you have different people doing different things, but we really are the, the master of the bone fixation. And the yeah. rib is a bone. True. So true. if it's anyone true. know how to fix it, it'll be really or respectfully, it's us. Exactly. But I, you know, so but anyway, I, I have done a lot of sternal reconstruction with the thoracic surgeon whenever they're not working very well because when they have a non-union of the sternum after sternotomy, I, and I'm comfortable with this area. They call me and we've done different things. If you have resection of the part of the manibrium, because the ortho are the people who do them, but they created the nice plate, striker plate for the ribs, which is very, anyone can fix. But realistically, the orthopedic surgeon are the masters of the, ortho, of the bone fixation. People get surprised when they're not sure. And they come and talk to us about rib injuries. And I said, this is not our specialty. And said, well, it's a bone. So <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> true. <laughs> it happens also with the nose fracture. It, yeah, it's the bone which is broken. <laughs> so it's ours. not the cartilage, in fact. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, general question about the post-operative protocol for rehabilitation after a scabber fracture. So the, do we put it in just arm sling, prevent movement, or general idea about this? So I think um, the, the idea is with any fracture that you want to fix it enough that you mobilize right away because we don't want stiffness. So uh, sling, I start passive range to 90 degrees from day one. Uh, they get it gradually, but they're allowed to reach 90. Uh, maybe three, four weeks, we start to go above 90. By six weeks, uh, I want to see full passive range of motion. And then I start active at six weeks. I know some surgeons like Peter Cole, he says he starts active early on. Maybe in some very stable fractures, I might do active assisted earlier than this. But for the complex articular one, I try to take it slow. But, but also because our patients, it's a different uh, setup. Most of my patients, I mean, Upper Egypt, they, we teach them a program. They go home and they're doing it by themselves or by the family rather than with a supervised physiotherapist. So we give them sort of the safe scenario that would not lead to any stiffness. But necessarily, I mean, if we delay a little bit of the muscle activation, it's okay. Then we work with the physiotherapy later on. Yeah. Pass him. Um, no, the same. The only thing I, again, you mentioned it already. I have no problem to get the patient stiff as long as they heal. Because stiffness, you can do arthroscopic release later or something. If you have an articular surface that you're not very sure about the fixation, I really want to make sure they will heal first. But if you're still, you're happy about your fixation, absolutely, you start to move them quickly. So I exactly what you said. Um, another question about when to add a plate on the medial border of the scapula. Um, That's a good point. Um, good question. So um, if you find some of the authors that have been working, especially like Peter Cole, is a very strong supporter of medial plating. And uh, when we did the so and a lot of authors do that. I think medial plating helps a lot that your reduction of the lateral border. So the forces are quite hard and sometimes it's very difficult to get that reduction. Um, if you don't have any sort of rotation of the body uh, and the lateral border is fine, a lot of time I've just fixed the lateral and uh, I've not seen much affection of the function. But uh, we're, if people sometimes start with a small medial plate Get that reduction it helps a lot your lateral border reduction so it aids if there is a big rotation definitely i would fix both planes but if it's just a displacement uh, i might do only a lateral plate that's this is sort of my experience i i agree i agree fully uh you mentioned that like it is mostly uh, i i i feel it will help medially because you have always twisting and change in the three-dimensional and in general, again, because uh, I don't know, I spend so much time around the scapula. If you think, where is the best bone in the scapula? You have the lateral border, you have the medial border, you have the spine of the scapula and posterior glenoid. And sometimes whenever you have something dusted, like, et cetera, you need to find a good bone to put something on it to, uh, to help with the alignment. And while the lateral is very good for the glenoid, for the body, and sometimes you have a split going all the way through the glenoid, this... This rotation is really, it's really not easy just to go only lateral. Sometimes medial, it will help give you the foundation 
to add for the lateral for that your fixation would be more ideal. Yeah. Uh, I think this will be the last question and it's uh, a conclusion if you talk, Prof. Hatem. Uh, uh, the, the, our colleague asked about what do you mean by, by the scapula is the new acetabulum? So just <laughs> highlight over the uh, uh, underlying messages in, in such sentence. I think, uh, it's, I think what I mean is that there is a lot more indications and we should be operating a lot. I mean, it's the ball and socket of the upper limb like the lower limb. So we operate a lot on acetabulum now. The criteria and indication of fixation are clear to everyone. So to me, this was like, you know, an old acetabulum when we, we didn't, the indication we're still developing. Now people should be aware of the scapula and we should be fixing a lot of them. This is because uh, they do lead to a good outcome, even I think better than the acetabulum too, if I can say so. Yeah. Thanks for Fatim for such a um, wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think uh, the final take home message is that we have to pay more and more attention to the scapula. Uh, it deserves more attention than we pay for it. Uh, finally, from the bottom of my heart, I would like to thank uh, Professor Basim Al Hassan from uh, Harvard University, USA. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us tonight. And also, I would like to thank my beloved professor, Professor Hatem Galal Zaki from Asut University for his interesting talk. Thank you so much. Hoping to see you again in the course. Thank you so much. Shukran, shukran. Shukran. Thank you, Ahmed, thank you very much and thanks for everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, tomorrow, inshallah, we will continue the uh, upper limb trauma course. We will see you at uh, 10 p.m. with uh, two very interesting talks. The first talk by Professor Amra Shwankair University about acute shoulder dislocation. And the second talk uh, about uh, the neglected shoulder dislocation by Professor Abdurrahman Ghanaini Mansoura University. Seeing you tomorrow, inshallah. Thank you so much and have a very nice evening. Thank you so much.